Hi, I'm Mike Barker with Elevate Outdoor Living. We specialize in creating one-of-a-kind outdoor living spaces that bring family and friends together, and I am a hardscaper. Welcome to the I Am A Hardscaper series on the How To Hardscape podcast, where we sit down and interview a hardscape business owner and do a deep dive on how they became a hardscaper and how they operate their business. The cost of doing business is going up and you need to know your numbers now more than ever. And we have resources at howtohardscape.com to help you with this. If you are looking for bookkeeping to CFO services, you can check out Cycle CPA at cyclecpa.com and get $200 off for mentioning the How to Hardscape podcast. We'll talk about this more later in this episode. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode. All right, Mike, let's get started to get to know a little bit more about you, yourself, how you got started in this industry, just to set some context on this. Let's get to know your background, if wherever you want to start from, and let's get in it from there to how you got started in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of have the the classic tale of uh, starting, a, starting off in maintenance, uh, started a lawn company actually back in high school, and uh, it's really evolved from there. So we kind of did all the the tracks through maintenance with residential, commercial, got into, you know, residential landscape, commercial landscape. And I finally found probably four years ago, the hardscape industry and everything that it has to offer um, really through, you know, social media. Social media has just been incredible uh, and inspiring, just watching, watching people grow and, and uh, you know, seeing what we can do with it. Yeah, absolutely. So with that starting and maintenance side and kind of scaling towards that landscape install to hardscape install, what was the timeline sort of like on that? Um, yeah, give it, give us a, like a little bit of background on timeline into all these different uh, services that you offer. Yeah, so, um, you know, in high school, I actually had a, a pretty interesting situation. School and I did not get along very well. Um, my senior year, I was able to work co-op and so I would get school credit to basically leave school and go to work for my myself, for my business. And um, that was amazing. I think they should do more of that uh, for sure for the trades. But, um, you know, we basically ran in and, and did residential uh, until I was probably 19. And then I started getting into commercial. Um, you know, once I did that, it, it kind of evolved into like the full service company. We weren't doing snow at that time in residential. Um, once we got into commercial, I started doing snow removal. Um, and then, you know, got into the the landscaping probably shortly after that, you know, when I, in my early twenties. What makes you decide to expand into hardscaping? What was like the appeal to it? What was the entry point into it for you for hardscaping? You know, so I really, I really enjoyed the landscape side of things, the install side. And, I really loved being creative with plant material and different different bloom times that we can have with different material and you know evergreen versus deciduous stuff. And I I learned about you know hardscaping and I'm like oh my gosh like the creative juices just started flowing on on once I started learning the products and what we can do and I mean three piece you know slab pavers to the giant slabs to you know you can just do so much with it. And, and that's really what got me intrigued. And I'm by far, you know, by no means the, uh, the most creative, there is just some incredible things that I've seen, but it just opens my eyes to what is possible in the industry. Today in your business, you've held on to maintenance and landscaping and hardscaping and all that. So, um, this, this is our last winter doing maintenance here. Uh, 2022 is going to be the last winter. Um, we have sold off our uh, maintenance accounts. We're finishing this winter. And so starting spring of 2022, we are going to be design build uh, exclusively. That's really interesting. Uh, and I know that you know uh, Antonio of uh, Zeppas. Yep. I just talked to him on the last interview. So this will be the next interview in that. And we actually talked about that a little bit in that interview in terms of his idea in holding on to that maintenance aspect of his business, that landscape aspect. Uh, can you talk through your uh, mindset behind kind of dropping that and, and going all, all in on design build as opposed to holding on to that and uh, kind of having that recurring income and having different, just, just sort of like expanding the services you offer as opposed to specializing into the only the design build aspect. To touch on uh, Zeppa, I had the opportunity to go down and, and tour his shop and 
the guy is just a wizard at efficiency and maintenance is incredibly dependent on efficiency. And he has, a, he has a dialed into a science. Um, I wasn't there and I'll be the first one to admit, like we just weren't there. We were running it pretty efficiently, but um, my focus, you know, was, was really on building the install side. And so <sighs> It, it was for us, it was just a little bit tougher. The, the, the culture as you know, we're a same, we're the same company, but the culture on the, the lawn and lawn care and maintenance side was different than the install side. It was, um, you know, guys were just not excited to be at work. And, and it was just kind of that, that rat in the wheel or mouse in the wheel type thing, just repetitive over and over and over again. Whereas, you know, over on the install side, seeing that start to finish project, it's rewarding. You know what I mean? You can, you can start a project and finish it and say, man, you know, we did that, you know? And I think that that was, that was a big factor was, you know, just trying to keep that, that culture up. You know, I want to create a, a company where people enjoy what they do. And if they don't enjoy what they do, you know, one person can, can really bring down everybody and, and um i think that was our biggest struggle and then of course it's a very competitive uh industry and it was it was almost just to the point where it's it's a race to the bottom on price um we did everything we could to differentiate ourselves um but you know that's kind of where i sit with it you know definitely i i really like your your mindset around that uh kind of breaking that down identifying you know where maybe your your business might be lacking in especially in that culture aspect because uh definitely a different culture sort of thing to deal with from maintenance as opposed to that installation as you broke it down there uh really interesting to think about there so have you transferred do your employees know that uh or or have you decided if those maintenance employees are going to sort of transition to that installation side uh how, how do you handle that once if you close down a division like that so this has been a pretty open conversation, um, you know, pretty much since summer of 2021 that, you know, Hey guys, we're, we're not going to be doing maintenance. Um, I've kind of, I've kind of talked with the team and, and especially on the maintenance side and said, you know, certain people, uh, we, we want you to come over. We want you to stay. We want to get you the, the training and the knowledge. Um, you know, a, a couple of guys just really like, they like mowing, um, and they don't want to do the, the hardscape side, but, um, you know, a uh, couple of them, a select few have, have come over to the install side. And, um, I think they're, they're excited to, you know, kind of have that change of pace. Okay. So then going from, uh, offering that maintenance side and then sort of transitioning more into this design build space, have you built up like a lead source? Like when, once a business gets going, uh, the leads sort of take care of themselves in terms of that word of mouth. But in that beginning stage, you kind of have to uh, go out there and, and grab your leads. Are you at a point in your business where leads for that design build work is kind of coming in word of mouth or do you, or, uh, you know, do you have to go out there and uh, market more? And especially since you're closing down maintenance, kind of transition that marketing towards the design build. What's your, your aspect in terms of where leads are coming from right now in your business? Yeah. So um, in, in 2020, January, 2020, a year ago, we rebranded from a plus lawn and landscape to elevate outdoor living. And that was really a turning point for us where, um, you know, when, when we were under AA plus and I was really trying to push these jobs, uh, I, I actually got pushback of people saying, well, you know, can you even, can you handle this? You know, your, your name says lawn and landscape. We branded very well as a maintenance company. Um, I completely shifted our, our image and our brand to, you know, elevate outdoor living and, you know, our logo, it doesn't even look like a landscape company. And I, I try to tell people, you know, we don't do landscape anymore. We're, we're outdoor construction and, you know, just trying to take a whole different mindset of it. Um, so to answer your question, you know, last year we, we made a pretty good push to, you know, brand. Well, we've got our trucks wrapped, trailers wrapped. Everybody's got, you know, really nice logo wear. Um, we did some marketing, uh, you know, some direct mail stuff and, and some online, um, through social media and it it worked out really well i mean we sold out our season by 
June 1st. Um, you know, this year we haven't done any marketing yet, but you know, it's, it's kind of the leads are, are starting to come in. Um, you know, and social media has been great. Um, we're really trying to, trying to kind of build that platform, but, um, I don't think word of mouth has, has really taken off yet for elevate. And so I, I think it's just a matter of time, uh, before that, that really takes traction and, and, and takes off. Yeah, that rebranding is really interesting and uh, something that I'm actually even considering in the near future here. What was the most difficult part of rebranding or at least of making the decision that, yes, we are going to rebrand? It seems like it was a, a surefire decision on your part saying that, you know what, people are looking at us like this. We need to be this. Let's do it. But what was the most difficult part in either pulling that trigger or in uh, implementing that rebranding? I'll tell you. I mean, I've been doing maintenance for 12 years. Probably the hardest decision was to let go of that maintenance. And like you said, that that reoccurring income, you know, that that you know is gonna come in. Um I think the hardest the hardest part was <laughs> I probably should have rebranded years ago. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, once we did it, you know, we just I took a lot of inspiration from um, you know, imagine design and build, you know, Vaughn's, uh, evolve. I mean, they all have like these great, these great brands built. And I, I just looked at, you know, some of these other companies and I'm like, man, we, we got to do the same thing. And, um, you know, yeah. And, and trying to get someone to build a logo. I wanted it so ridiculously simple. I told them, think of Apple, think of target, think of Walmart. It's just super simple brands that that are just going to be burned into your brain and uh i ended up creating our own logo because everybody was just trying to overdo it (laughs) nice that's awesome yeah i like you like you mentioned i've uh just being able to be on instagram and seeing people's profiles uh you recognize like their their business name their logos and just seeing yours uh go from aa plus right over to elevate as well as like you mentioned evolve was career tech lawn care over to evolve there's definitely these these branding rebranding uh changes that uh it it almost seems like uh it's just meant to be like yeah it makes total sense why you would rebrand uh and then seeing the professionalism behind your logo their logo other people's logos like you said you drew inspiration from uh yeah i think uh seeing the industry move towards these uh, professional logos, professional branding. Uh, it's really interesting. It's going to really push this industry forward in my opinion, at least. Yeah. You know, there, there's no reason why in our industry, we can't be looked at just like, you know, different trades, just like electricians, um, you know, plumbers, uh, HVAC, and, and even in a sense, you know, why can't we be respected? Like, you know, lawyers, doctors, and, and other, you know, higher up professions, you know, we, we are profession professionals, you know, we are masters of our craft. And, um, you know, that's really what I guess we're trying to do is an image. Um, I say, you know, we are, we're the best, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to say it, you know, and, uh, we're very proud of that. And, and, you know, my employees are very proud of that. You know, they, they really wear our logo and, and our brand with pride. And having spoken about employees, did they, did you see, what was their opinion on the, uh, the rebranding when they saw the new logo, the new gear, everything like that? What was their opinion? Uh, they hated that I chose black shirts. (laughs) 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 And so like, that's been the biggest battle is like, Hey man, we need to get different color shirts because black is, uh, too hot, but no, um, in all seriousness, uh, you know, they, they took to it really well. And, um, it was, you know, it took me a couple months to just kind of really hone it in. And, and I was sharing with them and getting their feedback as, as well as a couple others. And um, like I said, I think they, you know, the, the guys who I have and the guys and girls who I have on the install side, you know, they, they're, they're bought into the brand and, and they're, they're with me for the, for the long haul, which is amazing. I just want to take a moment to talk about Cycle CPA right now. In your business, you want accurate bookkeeping and financial statements every month, but instead, you're often left with limited time to focus on the accounting side of your business and no reports to show for it. At Cycle CPA, they not only handle the bookkeeping, but also provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking 
job costing, super important. Financials by service line, advisory meetings, and so much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants can do anything from bookkeeping to CFO services. And they're specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry. So if you want somebody to take care of your numbers to help you through that process so that you're not coming home late at night after a day on the job site and having to do this, visit CycleCPA.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. And since we're on that topic, how do you get that buy-in for from employees uh, and being with you over that long term and seeing that long term uh, vision, especially during a rebranding phase, especially during a phase in your business where you're really transitioning and going all in on that design build? How how have you or how do you feel you have got that buy-in from employees into the vision that you have? I'm big on um, the way that I lead is you know, I'm not going to ask anyone to do something that I haven't already done. And, and I try and really get, you know, the respect of these guys and gals and say, you know what, when, when you're going to need help, I'm going to be there, you know, for you. And we're trying to create this different company where, you know, I'm not pointing and telling you to go do this, you know, I'm going to go with you and and we're going to work it out together. Um, What I've really been trying to do is put more and more responsibility on our people so that they they feel like they're they're almost owning what they're doing you know what i mean and and they're not just you know they don't just have a job they actually they're owning their position and they're owning their part in building this this whole project or this whole company definitely i love that so getting back to leads now a lead comes into your business uh, they contact you through whatever uh, platform or email, text, whatever that might be. They call you. Where do you take that conversation when they initially contact you? How does that sales process start? You know, we we try and push everything through our website, and you know that's really where we where we start. Um, I had a, a great um, idea that I kind of stole from uh, Hardscape Ottawa, and they have a project estimator on their page, and I thought this was just the most genius thing. I've seen to where, you know, the, the customer, the step one is to go on there and fill out this project estimator and it's going to spit out, you know, a, a ballpark figure, but it's a good starting point for them. And so we, we adopted that and built something similar. Um, and then from there, you know, they, they fill out our form that just has all of the questions that we need to know. Um, and I know one thing that I think you ask a few people is, do we charge for, for consultations? And uh, we do. Um, and that has been one thing that we adopted that has really helped us with um, kind of weeding some people out. Um, we've got a pretty extensive uh, phone consultation before we even go out. So we really just want to make sure that we're checking all the boxes. We're, we're finding out the motive behind why they're wanting to do this project and really deep down into the, the psychological aspect of, of why they're calling us or why they're getting a hold of us, right? Um, because, you know, really it's, it's an investment to do some of these projects. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a lawn mowing, you know, they, they're investing a significant amount of money and time and they're putting a lot of trust in, in us to, you know, steer them in the right direction and do the right thing. So, um, you know, yeah, we, we have them check a lot of boxes and, and jump a lot of hoops. And one thing is, um, I'm really big on, we, we don't go out on site unless we talk money and I try and give them uh, some sort of idea of, you know, how much their project is going to cost. Um, and, you know, to touch back on the, the site consultation, you know, it started at $50 and I was nervous at just even charging $50 to go out and look. Um, and this year I, I raised it up to 250 and it's because, you know, when we go on site, I, I'm, I just tell the homeowner, you're going to leave with more knowledge than when I came there. I'm going to give you everything I got for one hour. You know, I'm going to give you all the design and, and, and everything that you need. So even if you don't go with us, you can take that knowledge and apply it to your project. Absolutely. So on that initial consultation call, before you set up the consultation on site, what are some questions that you definitely want asked uh, over the phone prior to setting up that consultation? And continuing with that, are there any red flags on that initial uh, phone call consultation that you say, you know what, it probably isn't a good fit for us to schedule an on-site consultation. So for your, for your first question, you know, kind of the questions are really, um, 
really digging into the motive of why, you know, why are they wanting this space, making sure that, you know, we're all clear on, on everything that you want. You know, you want a patio, an outdoor kitchen. Well, what do you want? You know, what do you want in, uh, in with the outdoor kitchen? And, you know, do you want lighting? Are you going to use this space, you know, day and night? You know, we're selling two outdoor spaces, right? We're selling a daytime space. We're selling a nighttime space. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that we, we get all that on the table. Um, time frame is another one. You know, if, if their time frame doesn't meet our time frame, you know, the relationship just isn't going to work. Right. Um, you know, and, and those are, those are probably the big ones. And, and then making sure that, um, all the influencers are influencers are involved in the decision, you know, and, and a lot of times I get, um, uh, you know, maybe husband, you know, calling me and, and I have to kind of dig into, Hey, you know, it is how involved is the wife in this decision as well? Because, um, you know, I've, I've had one situation where, you know, <laughs> The, the husband called me out and the wife was like, this not happening. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that's, that's basically the, the things that we need to go over. And then as far as like red flags, um, you know, really just, just price. Like I said, we talk price on the, on the phone and, you know, it's something that I practice. I'm in a, I'm in a group, um, that, you know, is a sales based group and, and, and just practicing, you know, practice makes perfect. And so, um, going through these role plays and just making sure that you're confident in yourself and when you're, when you're saying these prices, right. Um, you know, and, and kind of bracketing them. And, um, you know, I had one yesterday where, you know, I gave them a bracketed price. Well, the high price they weren't going to go for, but the low price, you know, they, they were, so they met that, that criteria. Um, you know, so if someone isn't willing to talk price over the phone with us, um, it's usually a red flag for us, you know, and, and, um, you know, I've had people where they're just like, can we just want you to come out? We just want you to come out and take a look at the project. Well, I can tell you a lot just with a picture. Right. Um, and so we just, you know, we try and make sure that we check those boxes. And then, um, that, that last thing is that consultation charge. I don't, I don't want the consultation money. Like I, I want your job, right? We want to do the project for you, but you know, if you're not willing to, you know, invest a little bit prior to, well then maybe it's just not the right fit. And uh, finally, when you do get on site for that initial consultation, what further questions are you trying to ask? Or is it a lot of clarifying things and kind of just presenting yourself at that point since you've already got uh, quite a bit of information from them in that initial consultate uh, phone call consultation like when we go on site i'm sure like a lot of us you know our brains are just spinning right they're going wild oh we could do this over here we could do this over here oh we have to you know look at some drainage there and, and those are some things that you know maybe we didn't touch on um or you know maybe they're they're open to you know, us being creative, but, you know, the big thing is just, you know, making sure that we're going to, we're going to hopefully not find anything too unexpected. Um, drainage issues seem to be kind of the, the unexpected things that we see. Um, even with pictures, it's just hard to see some of that stuff, but, um, you know, just, just making sure that the, the homeowners and I are, are really still a good fit and we're still kind of working through the, the conversations and, um, you know, we're, we're on the same page on their project. Okay. So the, you've got all the information you need from that initial consultation. You go back, you do a design. Uh, how do you present that design these days? Do you do it virtually? Do you try to meet with the clients? Is there a set process in presenting the design and getting that upfront payment to schedule? Yeah. So, um, currently we do, we do zooms, um, to do the design presentation. Um, we just got a, a, pretty small office space, but we would like to start inviting people in, um, and, and having them go through kind of the design and the, the estimate through there. So it gets them kind of out of their, their comfort zone and it puts them in ours so that they're, it's almost like a neutral zone, right? So they're, you know, it gets them out of their space and, and it kind of gets them in just a, a neutral zone where maybe they can be thinking a little bit more clearly on this is, this is the space and not focusing on, you know, if it's not a good fit and, get me out of there. And then your schedule of payments. Do you have a set scheduled payment amount in terms of getting that project scheduled, starting the project, ending the project, or does it vary from project to project for you guys? I will say it does vary 
So the smaller projects, we typically do 50%, uh, 50% down, and then we'll do like a 30% when we start and then the, the balance due. Um, on our bigger projects, I'm really pushing, uh, pushing everyone to put, it, it comes out to about a 30% deposit prior to, um, this allows us to order a lot of the material. And that's kind of the big thing is, you know, everyone knows that there's a there's a material shortage or you know in every industry there is somewhat and so i i kind of tell them hey if we do this 30 percent, we can order all the material and prevent any delays um and then first day of the project we're we're collecting an additional 50 percent. so you know we have 80 percent of our money the first day of the project um and you know i have not had any pushback with that I haven't had any issues with it since you brought up smaller projects, larger projects, it just came to mind here about uh, as, you, as you're continuing this transition and uh, getting out of maintenance, when looking at last year, what was the ideal Elevate project in terms of profitability, uh, the ideal project that came on board for you? And if it differs at all, what is the ideal Elevate project for this year and moving forward uh, that you want to have? Yeah, it's, it's wild. So, um, you know, with the, with the name change, so let's go back, you know, 2020 where I was at a plus, right. And our, you know, our average project size was maybe 15,000, 10, 15,000, right. We did this brand change and it was just a complete shift. I mean, our, our average project shot up to 35 to 40,000. Um, you know, and, and this year it's, it's, you know, significantly higher even then. Um, and so it's, it's pretty wild how it's, um, evolved and, you know, really we're just trying to showcase on a lot of our, our website and our socials, you know, we're showcasing the projects that we want to keep doing. So we we're showcasing some of these bigger, more involved projects. And I think that that helps. And coming to, uh, Talking about a horror story that you've had in your time in business. And uh, first off, do you have a horror story that you'd want to share with us? And the reason why I always ask this is to help those just starting out in contracting uh, prepare themselves for what could happen in contracting or even those already in business uh, to kind of prepare themselves or put things in place to, to prevent this from happening. But do you have a horror story from your time in business that you'd want to share with us? You know, I, I thought about this question because I know you're going to ask it. Um, and I, I asked my wife, too. I was like, what, what's our horror story? And to be honest, like it, it, it comes down to like it was with maintenance clients and it was just um, it, it was with maintenance. Now, I will say uh, one thing that has been kind of our fault, right, is just not not bidding the project properly and not having all of our numbers in line with where we need to be. And that's, that's kind of self-inflicted, but not too much with the, with the customers. So. Yeah, that's interesting. And it made me think of the, the 80, 20 principle where 80% of your headaches are coming from 20% of the maybe revenue coming into your business or profitability coming into your business. So that probably plays a role in you kind of cutting that out of your business. It does. And, and basically we kind of sat down and said, do we want to deal with a hundred people, like you said, in 20% of our, of our revenue and lower margins, or do we want to deal with 10 to 20 people a year uh, who are super happy at, you know, getting the project done? Anything in terms of installation side of thing, tools, equipment, uh, anything that you live by on the job site that you couldn't go without or just really change the way in which you operate day to day, uh, installation, tools, equipment, anything that you want to talk about here? Yeah, I I love tools. Um, and there's definitely guys who love tools more than I do. And and uh, they're kind of like uh, they're role models for me. But, um, you know, obviously, like uh, Andy and, and Jeremy, you know, they've they're just kind of kings of uh, having all the big equipment. But um, one thing that we purchased last year was uh, a Unilift. And um, we were we were just kind of trying to think of like, okay, how can we kind of help our, our uh, 
labor shortage situation and you know we we landed on the unilift and we have some other pave tool um vacuum equipment that you know we used prior to um and the unilift just kind of allows you know one guy to basically lay a whole entire patio while you know another two guys are working on another aspect of the project and that has been it's been a good purchase for us um i will admit that i would like to see it be used more um but as we grow it it, it will definitely be a, a continuing asset for us is that uh did you get the tracked model or the model that you use with the forks so i i got the tracked model um and i i think i got pretty lucky i bought it used actually with 18 hours on it from a, a local contractor who you know he told me he's like my guys can put pavers down faster and i'm like yeah they're probably dead tired at the end of the day though right <laughs> so right. um you know i i kind of looked at it like how can we make our jobs easier and especially because you know i was on site um you know last year still majority of the time i'm like i want to make it easier for myself to be working as well and um it, it has its its limitations but it's also you know when it works it's amazing i like that i I've, I've been looking at it more and more often and i know there's mixed reviews on it uh in terms of its limitations but it, like you said it's not so much about being faster but probably more efficient because if you think about how guys get tired guys and girls uh, get tired throughout the day their efficiency drops off throughout the day and then throughout that week you also feel that fatigue um so yeah i mean that that's a huge play in terms of looking at it the bigger picture and not seeing that efficiency drop off after lunch or getting into the end of the week there i will say if if, if you're considering buying you know a, a unilift or um you know the pave tool version you know i think the biggest thing the biggest thing that we've had to figure out is staging a material and just making sure that that material can be grabbed and swung over without moving the machine too much and um you know one person that comes immediately immediately to mind that has it dialed in is uh morales masonry landscaping over in um, i think they're in new york and i talked to him at, at uh, hna and he has these rubber tire dollies or rubber tire pallet jacks that he can move pallets around on the patio and i just i thought that was completely genius um you know when you need to get your material closer to your machine that's the way to do it yeah that's a great idea uh anybody on this podcast that you'd want to give a shout out to anybody in your journey that's helped you along the way that you look to uh for influence or anything in general uh anybody you want to give a shout out here yeah um i already mentioned a few and um you know there there's so many great guys and a lot of them i've just i've met through social media and followed them but um you know there's rc outdoors uh landscaping with dylan this kid is is over in california and and he's just absolutely killing it right now with the social media stuff um niagara outdoors uh morales i know chris was just on with you here not too long ago also um oasis design and build i mean there's there's so many of them you know and and uh these guys are just doing an amazing job they inspire me obviously with their different creativity and their efficiencies um you know and i just think that with social media has just completely changed the game and it allows you know contractors to just be more open with other contractors and and it's like it's a whole helping community right just like with what you're doing here with the podcast you know, it's, it's just amazing to help the whole industry evolve and get better. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants and then we can each raise each other up even further through this communication, through everything that we share online, uh, coming into Instagram with how to hardscape, I didn't know quite what the community looked like or was like, I was blown away at how willing people are to help one another in the industry throughout a large area. Right yeah it's it it really has been a true game changer um for me and and you know when i'm when i'm stumped you know there are numerous uh people who are willing to step up and and you know lend a hand final question for you and it's a big one what is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew from the very start it can be related to anything uh but what's one thing that you know now that you wish you knew at the very beginning knowing your numbers and knowing what to charge, um, how to recoup, you know, your overhead properly, 
you know, and just how to value your time, you know, and I think that was the biggest struggle was, you know, I, I mean, I'll be the first one to admit, like the first, I don't know, eight years of, of business, you know, I'd go look at a job and be like, yeah, we can do it for that. Not, not even really like knowing why I'm charging that. Right. And it finally, um, I finally got some, some coaching and some help to really knowing your numbers. And I mean, we're dialed in now. So that, that would be the biggest thing. You know, you, you can't, you can't stay in business if you, if you're not profitable. Right. Absolutely. Mike, thanks so much for your time today. Where can our audience go to find out more about you? Anything that you got going on? Uh, where do you want to direct them to? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, mainly on Instagram, um, at elevate.mi and, uh, we're also on Facebook and then we are hopefully going to be starting doing some YouTube this year. So that's our next uh, exciting adventure. Amazing. Mike, thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Go check out Mike at elevate.mi on Instagram. Show him some love for coming on the show and sharing his story with us today. Once again, that's cyclecpa.com for bookkeeping to CFO services to get $200 off. Mention the How to Hardscape podcast. And we'd love it if you subscribe to our podcast, left us a rating and review wherever you can. You can do that on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify. We really appreciate that. Or sharing any episode wherever you can with fellow hardscapers in the industry. That is much appreciated. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.